I wanted to be a professional rugby player. You know, growing up with that background, it's only helped me in doing my job now. You know, I, the, the parallels are, are, are so numerous between, I think, sport and, and art. Welcome to Story and Craft. Now, here's your host, Mark Preston. Hey, welcome. I'm Mark Preston. Glad to have you stop by, be a part of the show today. Uh, if you've never been here before, welcome. If you've been here for different episodes, uh, glad to have you back. Uh, today's episode, Going Down Under, actually, technically, we're going to the UK with a man from Down Under, Luke Bracey, uh, Australian actor, very talented. A uh, couple new films out right now on Netflix. He's an interceptor. Uh, also, he plays Elvis's best friend in the new Baz Luhrmann movie, Elvis, which is getting rave reviews. Everybody's talking about how uh, how great that is. Uh, going to be chatting with him and uh, going to you know, cover the Australian bases. Vegemite does come up. Just heads up. Now, don't forget Story and Craft Pod dot com. Once again, the website Story and Craft Pod dot com. Everything you could hope to know about the show is there. You can shoot me a note. Uh, also, on your favorite podcast app, wherever you're listening, make sure to follow the show. That way you get a little uh, reminder uh, every time a new episode rolls out. All right, so today it is Luke Bracy Day, right here on Story and Craft. Where are you joining me from today? I'm in uh, London. I just, just moved into a flat in London, actually, so it's kind of my first kind of home for longer than a couple of months in a few years so it's nice it's nice and well, that's got to be nice it is it is it's nice to to hang some clothes up now, have you been uh, traveling for projects a lot or have you just been kind of sampling different places and decided that, okay uk is going to be where you want to land well kind of traveling for work i did um i was back home for you know from about christmas 2019 so i had a, a, a few months at home there and then was up in the Gold Coast filming Elvis from about September for about six months, then back in Sydney for a few months. And then I was in North Carolina doing a job, saw some family in England for Christmas, went back to New York to do a job in like February till April. And now I'm here and I finally found myself a little home, which I'm, I'm really excited about, actually. Very good. For, you're from Sydney, though, originally, correct? Originally, yes, yes. My, um, my mum's originally English. Um, but um, has been in Australia for, for many decades now. So I've got the British passport, which makes makes everything a bit easier. Very nice. Uh, wait, so they filmed Elvis on the Gold Coast? Yeah, we filmed on the Gold Coast. Really? I did not... Everything. Oh, that must have been... Is that where... Um, I heard Tom Hanks got... Uh, you know, he got COVID when he was in Australia. Was he filming uh, Elvis at the time? Is that... Uh... I think that was... That was... Uh, I think he got it maybe a few days before they were supposed to start shooting the first time around. And then it got kind of um, put on the back burner while the whole world went through COVID. And then it came around again. I actually wasn't attached to it on the first way around. But then COVID happened and, and they needed to recast. And I was lucky enough that I was in Australia at the time. So the ball fell my way and Baz gave me a call. So, you know, quite fortuitous on my end. Very. Hey, any chance to be in a Baz Luhrmann show? I mean, gosh, that, that's got to be just too much fun. But congratulations on the gig, man. That's um, I've heard nothing but really wonderful things about Elvis. And, um, but Baz Luhrmann, I mean, God, he's, he's just, he, he's, I hate to use like, um, I hate to say Hollywood speak. He's got a very singular vision, his very unique style, you know. So it was, uh, uh, was it a fun experience shooting the show? It was a blast. It was a blast, you know. Baz is such a uh, a wild creative. Him and Catherine Martin, they're they're geniuses, you know. Like the worlds they create are so unique and so larger than life. And I guess he's him and Catherine are really the only people to tackle Elvis. If we're going to be honest, I don't know if there's another filmmaker or storyteller in the world that kind of has the largeness that was required. Um, but Baz is just. You, you just sit there in awe some days on set where you kind of there's days when you don't quite know exactly what you're going to get or what you're doing. And then suddenly you'll see something that is just pure magic. And it's, it's, it's really impressive to see. And then just on a, on a personal level, he entrusted you as a actor to do your job and to know the character well, and to come with ideas and to be fresh and open with it. And he was, so collaborative and, and so open that way to, you know, our ideas and, and everything like that. I, I couldn't speak highly enough of working with Baz and, and with everyone, the whole crew, the whole cast. It was 
yeah, it was a really special movie. When you're there for six months doing something as special as that, you become a big old family. And I think we all were aware that we were, that we were part of something pretty unique and, and pretty special. This is uniquely, it seems to be Australian with him and with, uh, I see Doc, was it Dr. Montgomery? I always have a heart. It says, is that how you pronounce Daker. his name? Dr. Montgomery. Dacre. 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 I, yeah. So I see he was in it and, um, and I mean, being able to shoot near home has got to be cool. Uh, now, Gold Coast is that is that uh, considered like is Brisbane on the Gold Coast or is That's, that uh... Brisbane's about an hour up the freeway. So the Gold Coast okay. is kind of the, the real bottom part of, of Queensland, the state of Queensland, and it's just it's absolutely beautiful there. The weather's unbelievable. The surf's really great. It's such a lovely place to be. Um, you're, you're, and, you're killing me right now. See this. See, I have these. I have these fanciful design, uh, ideas of being a um, uh, a US expat living maybe in in uh, Melbourne or, or uh, uh, Brisbane, and uh, I have friends in both places. And they both like whatever you do, don't go to Sydney. I was like, why? It's like it's like no, no, no. They're, they're too stuffy out there. I was like, so well, no. I got to sample Sydney as well. Got to check that out. But uh, look, I'm I'm from Sydney, so so I'm 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 a little biased in that way. But but you know. Maybe people from Melbourne and Brisbane might have a little chip on their shoulder about Sydney. Um, Sydney's a beautiful place. We hug, we hog the limelight, and I get it. Melbourne's an awesome city. Brisbane's really on the up. It's a really cool place. But Sydney's not too bad. Don't let them tell you that it's all bad in Sydney. <laughs> so the uh, so kind of going uh, going kind of origin story was it was this something uh, doing the acting thing was that something in the DNA or were your folks in acting or uh, anything creative or did you just kind of break the mold and decide just to kind of do something on on your own there yeah it was yeah no no history of art or acting or kind of anything in my family my father's a builder my mother um, used to work in a bank um, just you know, when she was younger and then now works kind of running the books for my dad's business. My sister's one of, you know, a physiotherapist and a veterinarian. So no one, no one of the, um, uh, of the thespian kind of uh, background in my family, but it was just something that I completely fell into, something that I never planned on doing. Um, I got asked to audition for one of the, the long running soap operas in Australia when I was about 19. It's called Home and Away. And I, I went into the audition and didn't really know what I was doing. And then the next day I got a call saying I got the job. So I had to. Isn't uh, Neighbors the big one? Uh, Neighbors, is that the other big? Is that a soap Neighbors, opera or is it just a long running series? That's a soap opera. So Neighbors is the one that's kind of set in Melbourne and, and Home and Away is set in a, a fictional place called Summer Bay. So they're both really long running kind of, they've been on since the 80s and they're just kind of classic classic Australian soap operas and, and have produced, you know, everyone kind of starts there. And it's an amazing place to start if you're going to act in any way. Yeah, I think a lot of people started their music. Was it, who had it? Well, I was younger many, many moons ago and he'd land far, far away when I had a, a radio show. I had, a, I had a, we were playing, it was a Tina Arena. That's who it yeah. was. I think she was on. And I, and it seems like a lot of the singers also had, uh, the folks that came out and, you know, had musical careers, uh, they would start there as well. Yeah, well, Ky- Kylie Minogue started on Neighbours. So, yeah, there's um, there's a whole history of people that's, but in terms of a place to start, if you don't know anything about acting, it's a great place to start. You really learn kind of, you know, that it is a big team. And, and I came in when it had already been on for 20 something years. So having no idea, you kind of come in and, and you've got to fit in and, 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 and do your work and, and, and be part of the team. And, and it's a great place to, to kind of ply your trade and, and the turnover's quick. It's really hard work. And, and I think... Oh yeah, That's you have to of, like memorize uh, like yeah. tons of dialogue on soap operas, and, and you just kind of plow right through it. I mean, I don't know if I could do that. I'm not the best at memorizing, so I'd never done it before, <laughs> so I'd, I'd never learned any lines or anything. So it was, I, I look back now, and I, it's not the bit that I remember, but I, I, I must have spent many, many a Sunday just memorizing lines for the next week because we'd film and uh, you know a half hour episode a day essentially. For Monday to Friday, and um, yeah, then you're doing out, you know, external sh- scenes for the next week's storyline, and yeah, it's it's really getting thrown in the deep end. And but that's a great way to start anything, isn't it? By just oh yeah, baptism by fire sometimes exactly, a, or they say OJD on on the job training. Exactly. Now, how did you how did you even uh, get on Home and Away? I mean, was this something that somebody just kind of saw you say, hey dude, why don't you try out the why don't you try auditioning for this show or did kind you just of, gonna yeah, come in the I, side door. I went to school um, 
and played rugby with a guy who whose dad is a, a one of Australia's most renowned television producers, a guy called John Edwards. Wrote and produced amazing shows, Secret Life of Us, Love My Way. Um, and I finished school and he just randomly called me up and asked me to audition for something. And then I just went in and thought I was doing him a favor. And then kind of a few months later, this casting agent called me up and said, hey, you auditioned for this thing a while ago. Would you like to come and audition for Home and Away? And I thought, oh, yeah, okay. And I went in and next day I got the call saying I got the job. I had to call up my father who I was working with as a builder at the time and say, oh, I think I'm going to be a little busy for the next month or two. And and they're like, what's going on? I said, I've been asked to be on television. So not every day do you get asked to be on TV. I thought, why not go for it? Yeah, and I saw what's funny. It is very serendipitous today. I've got my, uh, you know, my phone or Google Photos, like, hey, this day in history or whatever, they pop something up. And it was um, something, I, it was a show I was in, God, a number of years back. And I saw you were in West Side. And you, uh, uh, yeah. I think Odette, Odette, I uh, was it back in 2013 and Odette yeah. was in it. And I was like, and so I had a couple scenes with her in this uh, miniseries. And I was like, what a, what a charming lady she is. But, uh, um, oh, yeah, I, I, but I, I'd never seen West Side. What was that about? As, uh, uh, it was, it was a, it was a pilot that I, that, that we did back then that, um, that, uh, obviously didn't, didn't end up going past the pilot stage. Um, Mick G directed it and there was a few people in it. Um, Bruce Greenwood was in it. Odette was in it. Some, some really fun people. It was a, yeah, really fun experience. I'd never done anything like that. A pilot was, and we filmed it in Venice in Los Angeles and, um, yeah, it was really fun. It was a great experience, but yeah, you know, it didn't. didn't was that your first U S based, uh, show? Or was that the first thing you did over here? No, I'd done, I'd done a movie or two, a small movie or two before that. I'd had a, 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 a part playing kind of um, the bad guy in G.I. Joe Retaliation where I kind of wore a trench coat and a mask and, you know, <laughs> did a funny mean walking for a few months when I was about 21. And, <laughs> mean walking, I like Yeah, that. And, um, and then that kind of came about. And then right after that, I, I, I booked November Man with Pierce Brosnan and I went off and shot that. And then it kind of all really kind of started moving from there. I shot that 2013 and then the start of 2014, I, I got the best of me. And then, a, 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 you know, a, a couple of months after I finished shooting that, I went off and did Point Break and that took me to the end of there. And then after that, I did a, a, a little job here and there and did uh, Hacksaw Ridge. And it just kind of, one of those things where once the ball starts rolling, it seems to, if you keep the momentum up, you can, you can find your way up the ladder each time. And that's all that I've been trying to do really is just go a step up with every job that I'm doing kind of personally and, 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 and professionally. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think that's, I think momentum is such a great uh, way of putting it because you just mm. got to keep, you just got to keep in it. You know, uh, I mean, Hacksaw Ridge, it was uh, Mel Gibson. He directed yeah. that, didn't he? Yeah. And so was it, how was amazing. that project to work on? I mean, Mel's a genius telling stories he's he's amazing and such a a, a warm and, and and giving person and such a great person to work with i'll if i if i got to work with mel again any time in my life i would i would sign on the dotted line right away i i i, I had such an amazing time he taught everyone so much and i know in, in the in a, in a you know a similar vein to baz you know makes everyone on the set feel like they're an integral part of telling this story. And that's how you get the best out of people. I find like the best directors I've ever worked with are always the best leaders. And leadership comes in many forms. Yeah, do you prefer working with directors that kind of say, okay, you're, you're kind of like Clint Eastwood. It's kind of like he's hiring you. He recognizes the skills. You do your thing. Or do you like the directors that kind of shepherd you along and you know, like get real specific on kind of what they're looking for? Do you just kind of like to be cut loose to uh, let your uh, to kind of spread your wings, do your thing, or do you like somebody guiding you? Well, I like I like a bit of both in the way that one thing I really enjoy about my job is that it's a I always use sports metaphors. It's a team sport making a film. You know, if I it, you know to be an individual artist is to be a painter or a writer or something like that. Whereas I love the fact that when we make films, it's a, 
a huge team. It's a, it's a huge group of people that have individual skills and expertise that all come together. And when we're all working at our, at our best, we create great stuff. And I love the collaborative process between us actors and the director, between the writers, between the camera department, between costume and may I, I just enjoy the, the complete kind of flooding of ideas from, from a, many different angles. That always excites me when you get to be in a room and, and either rehearse or, or talk about what's coming up and, 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 and spread ideas and, and kind of, you know, two people thinking about the one thing are going to come up with a third thing that's completely unique. So, yeah, I, I guess, I guess that's what I enjoy about the, the work is that it's different every time. And that there's no set way to do it. But the one thing that's important is that you're a team. You mentioned the sports thing. You you did uh, uh you played rugby. You said did you do that just in um, high school or did you do that? Uh, did you go to university and do that? That was my that was my entire passion as a child. I wanted to be a professional rugby player. That's what well, I, I got to ask. Do. Who who was your team though? Growing up, well, I'm a I'm a huge huge Manly Seagulls fan in the uh, NRL at home. Um, absolutely. Absolutely love them and, and uh, ride every game of theirs. And, um, yeah, I'm a huge, huge fan of theirs. Um, so that's my team. Um, but, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. And, and, and I think, you know, growing up with that background, I, I, it's only helped me in doing my job now. You know, I, the, the parallels are, are, are so, so numerous between, I think, sport and, and art in a funny way. Um, it's this extreme training and honing of a craft for these special moments where you've got to turn it on and you hope that all the training that you've done is with you in that time so you don't have to think about it and that it, that it happens and this kind of little bit of magic that happens um, after all this preparation and, and you don't get anywhere without preparation and I think coming from a sports background, that's such an invaluable thing, you know. You know you can, that's you can most really, of it, yeah. You can rely on inspiration and, and, and raw talent up to a certain point, you know, and then and then you've got to couple that with, with, with hard work, really, and, 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 and dedication, and you'll be amazed what can come of it. Yeah, I think as far as the, uh, stri- uh, the, uh, the uh, rugby thing, I was watching, oh, there's an American TV, there was an American TV host named Anthony Bourdain had the show. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, we tried, okay. And he went, I think, I don't know if it was a, an episode where he was in Sydney or Melbourne, but he went to go see, was it the Rabbitohs, I think, some of the teams? Yeah, and, that's Russell Crowe's team that he's owns. Yeah, apparently they're always you know doing well, and they just don't do well at the very end yeah, of the season. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of like I'm a big baseball guy, my Texas Rangers, same thing. It's like, never won a big uh, championship, you know. As far as um, uh, the, the, the Elvis movie, which is, I've heard nothing, like I said, nothing but great things about it. Were you, how, how dialed in were you to the mystique and the history the, of, of all things Elvis? Were you already very aware or did you have to do a little bit of uh, research before you uh, jumped into the film? I think like everyone, you know, I certainly, certainly knew of Elvis and, and knew of a number of his songs and, and, and kind of his influence. But, but obviously once you start diving into it and you get, a, you get the full scope of kind of this insane life that he lived in over a short period of time. He was only 42 when he passed away. And really? I didn't seemed, know he was that young, really? He was 42. that young and, and it wow. seems like he existed for the entire 20th century in a way. You know, once he burst on the scene, it seems like he, he, he existed for such a huge period and he went through so many different stages in his life. From, you know, and that's what the, the movie's great at, it kind of him as a young boy and then through the 50s, he's, he's this one person and then he involves into another person in the 60s and then the 70s. And, and, you know, there were some songs that I wasn't aware about, some some parts of his life that I didn't didn't know about, but diving into it, I mean... I don't think anyone's going to have a life or an impact on on people the way he did and still does. You know, he's one of the most loved entertainers in the world still. And he died 40 years ago, 45 years ago or something. So I, I try to explain to my, my kids there. I was trying to explain when I said speaking with you and I was like, Elvis, you have to understand that there was no star 
really like him ever until he showed up on the scene. You know, yeah, there are other people like you'd have Sinatra. He would sing. He would be in movies, but. Uh, but there's something about, like Elvis. I mean, you know, he really seemed to put Vegas on the map also as, uh, you know. He created the idea of a residency, didn't he? You know. Yeah. Oh, indeed, indeed. Oh, well, the colonel was the mastermind behind that. But another thing with Elvis is he, you know, it's this perfect storm of, of, of it's this perfect storm of, of things to create Elvis and, and what he was. You know, he was, television was just starting. You know what I mean? And And, and this idea that he could be in someone's, living room and, and, and to be such a larger than life figure and to, to be something that no one had ever, no people had ever seen before that most people hadn't seen before. And then for that to exist in people's homes, like it never had before just catapulted him as well. You know, the, I don't think there'll be anyone who really went through what he went through when it comes to his rise and, and his, and his Zenith and, or his numerous Zeniths of his career yeah and considering you it's got to have that level of charisma at the same time you're the first one doing all these things mm. you know everybody makes mistakes but i mean he really had a consistent path and then he would just dis- not disappear but like we went into the military or whatever you know he had these momentary breaks but he came mm. in a little bit reinvented now jerry Schilling, uh the character you played how does he fit into the ecosystem of the elvis world well jerry jerry is um one of He's Elvis's kind of best mate in a way. Um, they know each other from back in Memphis when they were teenagers. And then more, uh, Jerry ended up going to the University of Arkansas on a, f- a football scholarship, funnily enough. He came back one summer holidays and Elvis was just blowing up and he was just about to go to to Los Angeles. And he kind of said to Jerry, hey, you want to come over? And Jerry said, you know what? Yeah, I will. And he went over there and, and you know, was kind of – quote unquote part of the Memphis mafia, but more, he, he kind of found his own life as well. Jerry, he ended up being a, a, a music manager, managed the beach boys and, and a bunch of other people. But he, he was kind of the one person that didn't want anything from Elvis and was just looking out for his friend, you know? And, and that's kind of what you see in the movie that Elvis always had someone trying to get something from him. What in whatever cap capacity that is, um, not necessarily fiscally, but, you know, attention, love, whatever. There's always people wanting things from him. And, and with Jerry, he just wanted the best for his friend and um, kind of was was the one that, that was always looking out for him. And, and, you know, selfishly to play that role, it's a really lovely character to play and a, a really nice person when your job is to be someone's good mate and, um I got a lot of respect for Jerry that way. He, he he really cared about Elvis and the family, and I think he's still very close with Priscilla. And um, I think that's just a testament to the kind of guy he is. Did you have a chance to uh, to chat with him, have a phone conversation, or meet up with him? I sent him an email or two before I started shooting, but I never heard back from him, unfortunately. But I've I heard he saw the movie and, and really loves it, so hopefully I'll get to get on the phone with him at some point and, and just say good day and, you know, Hopefully, he can tell me he's proud of me. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, I think that uh, just the commercials alone, if they, if they, uh, like for instance, Austin Butler, when I see him, I, I think the commercials are really showcasing kind of the early part of his career. I mean, he seems to have a little bit of that mystique, a little bit of that charisma. You know, it seems that Baz kind of uh, captured that. I mean, what was what was your kind of thought on here's this guy playing this icon you know and having to kind of carry the weight of that what was what was that experience like watching that transformation i mean what's what's impressive watching something someone tackle such a huge thing is um the the work that goes into it i was thoroughly impressed by the dedication that he had and and the effort that he put in and 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 everything like that And, and you know to have that pressure on you and for how he handled it and, and to, and to not only survive, but thrive and, and, and put in such a, a, a wonderful performance. It's, I'm just so happy for him. You know, uh, you know, I played his best mate in the movie and we became really good friends over the filming. And so for me, I, I just feel I'm, I'm, I'm proud of him for, for tackling something so big and, and, and doing a great job and, and never shying away from it. And there were plenty of days where on set you'd kind of, you just do a double take because you're watching Elvis. And then, you know, we had in the makeup rooms, we had just 
that were just plastered with with photos of Elvis from all ages, all the way around. And you get in after a day of work and take off your makeup and your wig or whatever. And then you kind of look at these photos and you're like, that's not Elvis. I just saw Elvis, you know, like he, he really blurred the line where they, they were really indistinguishable a number of times. And, and selfishly as well, uh, there were so many days on set where I just got to go to an Elvis concert for 12, <laughs> for 10 hours. You know what I mean? And I got to go now, to- Now, was he singing? So was he actually singing or were they playing a, an El, actual Elvis track with him? He would sing. So all the really? young Elvis is, is Austin. And then for the older stuff, they mix his voice with El, with older Elvis. But he does, he sings all the way through it. He was unbelievable. And the way he- the way he took it on and the way he gave it everything, every single take. And, you know, we had, we had scenes where there's 400 extras and the, the energy in those rooms, be it the 68 comeback special or, or, or in the, the, the international hotel in Vegas, it was, uh, it was fever pitch. And that was, wait, was it, was the 68 special? Was that where it was like in the round and he was yeah, wearing like black, black yeah. yeah, yeah, you know that is. The, I remember my parents have that on uh, VHS, and I was just farting around as a kid, and I threw it in. And I was just like watching stuff, you know. This is before we yeah. had cable. He had a really good sense of humor. He was, I mean, like I say, I keep saying charisma, um, and that that's the thing that would be intimidating if I'm an actor to kind of embody that, you know that that still having a sense of humor but being the sex symbol, you know, at the same yeah. time, you know. Well, I think that was the great thing about the '68 special is that, you know the way they kind of designed that was going to be a whole other thing. And, and they, they, we chart this in the movie of what it was actually going to be, but what it ended up turning out to be was something completely different to what the Colonel had in mind and what he wanted. And a lot of it was Elvis, you're a charming, funny guy. And let's just show the people that, you know, he'd been making movies for 10 years and, you know, these formulae kind of movies that people really enjoyed at the start, but it had become a bit cliche. And, and so it was time to, to really kind of show people that Elvis still exists and he's still this effervescent and, and, and kind of uh, engaging and warm character. And, and that was one of the great things about the 68 special is that it was him in his element, you know, playing in the round with his old band, just having a good time. They, they kind of saw the band and him mucking around in the dressing room beforehand and went, you know what, we should put that on stage because that's magic. And that's kind of what it was. It was stripping him all the way down to who he was and who he was, was this once in a lifetime, once in a generation um, character who was warm, funny, talented, sexy, all the things. And, and to really strip it down into that, it was a great show. You, you had mentioned the thing with uh, Colonel Tom Parker. I mean, of course, Tom Hanks, you mentioned the makeup trailer. How long did it take to get his makeup set every single day? You know? Oh, many hours. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of respect for Tom on in, in, when it comes to that. It was, yeah, it was a number of hours in the chair for him and, and, um, to get up and give that performance while doing it, you know, a lot of respect for Tom and, and you know, any nuggets of wisdom. Yeah. Well, nuggets of wisdom in the way that just to how to kind of carry yourself on set and, and, and be professional and, and be a nice guy and, 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 and do a good job and, I was lucky enough to do a number of scenes with him and, 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 you know, play, play with him really. And, uh, it was a, yeah, definitely a, definitely a pinch yourself moment when you're, when you're standing next to Tom Cruise, talking to him in an American accent, pretending to be someone else. And Tom Hanks too. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. He said Tom Cruise. I'm sitting here thinking, oh, sorry. I was like, wow, Tom, Tom Cruise. Hanks, is, sorry. There's this, know, there's Tom simply Hanks. too many Toms happening, you know, right now and, uh, on, <laughs> I just walked past. No, I just walked past a, a, a Top Gun poster. That's what it was. I literally just walked past a poster with him on it. Oh, I geeked out on that. I took my son to go see Top Gun. And I was like, I was back to 1986. I was back to being 13 years old again. I was like, oh, this is just for for guys of my generation. That was that was the thing, man. Uh, but no. So, but Tom Tom Hanks was. It's funny because Tom Hanks to me is a lot like Elvis was. He's had his stages. He was doing the rom coms mm. and the. Yeah. You know, I remember watching on Bosom, Bosom Buddies when he did a TV show years mm. ago. So to to be there with him, I mean, he just, uh, I mean, everybody loves Tom Hanks. It's a, it's a surreal moment. It's a surreal moment because he kind of is movies, right? My entire life, yeah. it's been him. When I think of movies, he's been in them and been in all the great ones. And so it's quite surreal when, when you get to work with him in a movie. It's, it's a, it's, it is a real pinch yourself moment. You, you never quite think you're ever going to. Um, 
work with someone like that because they kind of exist on a screen and then suddenly they're in front of you and you're, and you're, and you're creating it. So when, when I got to see the movie and see me standing next to him and talking to him, I was a bit, oh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in a movie. You know, it's one of those moments, you know, it's, it's quite a surreal. I, I think that a surreal would be the word I would use as well. Which did you shoot first, this, or did you shoot Interceptor? Or were they, like, just butt-to-butt? Butt? Are they butting up shot, against each other? Yeah, so we we finished this um, end of February, start of March 2021. And then I went down to Sydney, and I think I must have started Interceptor in April sometime. And, um, yeah, that was um, that was really great. It was something, obviously, completely, completely different. I hadn't ever played a bad guy before, so that was really, really fun. Um, and yeah. I got to work well, with Chris Hemsworth. Uh, he's an Aussie as well, correct? And didn't he produce yeah. this? Yeah, he produced it. And, and Elsa, obviously, his wife is, is the main star. And, and Chris has a little cameo in it, which is really funny and really nice. And yeah, they're great people. And it was a really, really fun job, actually. Um, got to work with Stuart Beatty, who I'd worked with before on Danger Close. And, and he's a, a, a such a talented writer and such a great guy. And then Matthew Riley, the director, first time director. And uh, you know the success of Interceptor. You know there's been it's getting some really good numbers, and and it couldn't happen to a to a better bloke. You know I'm so happy for Matt. All he's ever wanted to do is direct a movie. Yeah, I think I think on Netflix it's like number three or number seven. I, I forgot where where it was landing last uh, last night, or last few, last few nights. I forgot when I checked it out. But I mean you're definitely a bad guy when you got blood splattered on a window and you're draw, yeah. drawing drawing a frowny face in the blood. I'm like, yeah, he's a bad dude. You know. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, um, but no, it was really great fun. Now, where did y'all shoot uh, Interceptor? That was in, in Sydney. So I got to be home and weirdly have kind of a quote unquote normal life for a, for a couple of months, which was strange. You know, I'd go to work Monday to Friday and then on the weekends I'd go to the pub and, and watch the, the footy with my mates at the at the pub and go to my sister's for a barbecue on Sundays. And it was this weird kind of normal life that was just so enjoyable to, to, to do your job. Normally, you know, we have to work in strange places we've never been before and kind of create your own little environment, but to be able to do it at home, uh, you know, such a blessing. I, I love working in Australia. I think it's one of the best places to make movies. The crews are best in the world and, 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 and as a place to live, it's, it's pretty unbeatable. And my youngest gets off to college in two years. And I, the, the idea is I've always wanted to, as I mentioned, be an expat, go somewhere. To me, Australia seems like a great place to land for a couple of years, you know, to, to live. And um, I'm a big food nerd, man. I would just love to, just to be eating around Australia, you know. Oh, we have so, some of the best food. We have some of the best food, best produce, great restaurants. And in terms of Australia, it's, it's, it's just a lovely place to be a human being. It's a really nice place to exist. You know, it's, 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 it's beautiful, um, uh, lovely way of life, um, nice and carefree. And yeah, I've, I, I'm, I feel very fortunate that I, that I grew up there and, and get to go back there all the time. Well, you, being able to shoot a, a film and be able to go home, mm. uh, you know, every day or be able to go back to your own place uh, instead of a hotel. That's going to be, that's going to be really nice, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. And then just having your mates around and having your family around and then getting to kind of experience it with you. And, and, you know, um, I remember I, I wrapped into Scepter and my best mate was there and we went out and had a big beer and he'd never been able to be with me when I'd finished a job before. So that was really fun, you know, and just, all those little things. Oh, that's a question I've got for you because in the U.S., I don't hear it promoted nearly as much. I'd, I'd say the mid late nineties they were pushing Fosters really hard, and I was talking to a friend of mine from uh, from Brisbane, and he's like, "Dude, he said nobody in Australia drinks Fosters." What do, what is what would you say would be the iconic uh, when you're getting if somebody's pulling a pint? You just say, "I want a beer." It's going to be the one you want. What's the good Australian beer? Probably, probably the the most well known around the country. I mean, each state kind of has their different ones, but I'd say. Um, VB, Victoria Bitter. That's a pretty classic one. They always had some really fantastic ads and they always had a really classic um, theme song for the, for the beer on the ads. And that's a pretty, that's a pretty classic beer. That, what was the tagline? A hard earned thirst needs a big cold beer and the best cold beer is Vic, Victoria Bitter. That's a great classic tagline. 
you know, I, I'm not a big drinker necessarily, but I, I do like a good beer. And to me, that's my cheap way of traveling the world is having a beer. You know, some people do with yeah. wine. I'm a beer guy. Um, now, wh- are you working on anything right now? Any projects uh, as you're in the UK? Uh, right now, no, I'm, I, I'm not. I just, as I said, I just finished one in New York um, called Maybe I Do. We finished that maybe in April. And, and just I've kind of... I kind of did Elvis and then Interceptor and then another film and then a film called One True Loves and then maybe I do. So for me, I'm actually just kind of going to sit down and take a breath for a moment um, for a month or two and just kind of reassess where I am and and, and kind of what I want to do next um, work-wise because I don't I, I, I don't quite know. I, I think I've just been a bit run around with all this work, which is such an amazing place to be. And I feel so fortunate, but I, I think I just need to stop and have a breath and, and kind of try and try and understand what I've done the past couple of years. Cause it's been bang, 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 bang. And, and, a, and a number of different types of films. So for me, I'm like, okay, I just maybe need to sit and, and try and figure out what I've done and, and, and therefore what I want to do next and, and, and try and, as I say, just keep doing something different, doing something a next step, step above um, and, and just keep um, plowing forward. And yeah, so, so maybe just go sit down on the patio with a Victoria bitter, sit back, exactly. contemplate. <laughs> you know what? That sounds like a great idea. Well, as we wrap up here, what I always like to do is I always like to kind of throw out a set my, what I call my seven questions is to kind of a little fun, get to know you. Um, and the first question I always like to ask folks is, what's your favorite comfort food? You know, that thing, it just kind of brings you back home. You're having a rough day or even a great day. You just want to sit down and have a bite of it. Uh, there's, there was a, uh, there is a, um, just a really simple um, pasta dish that my mom made. It's just smoked salmon and cream pasta with some like onion in it. And it is the most warm, lovely meal and uh and i i love cooking that it always reminds me of, of of home and it's that's a great comfort meal nice nice bit of bread and butter with it you know creamy smoked salmon pasta a little bit of of lemon juice and yeah that's, that's, so that's funny, a, cause actually something like that i make for my kids and my daughter lily my oldest likes to throw in a bunch of capers on top of that that's how we almost have something identical to that. yeah i don't mind a caper here and there yeah exactly <laughs> yeah it's, that's that's a really great comfort food also, just Vegemite on toast. Like I never go wrong with, if I ever feel, and that's like not even trying to be, not even trying to be stereotypical here. It's just great Vegemite on toast. You can put a bit of cheese on it. You can have it with some avocado, whatever. But that's just great. You know, my friend in Brisbane brought a, a jar. My son actually likes it. I, I met my friend in LA, and he brought me a uh, brought me a jar. He said you got to put butter on it first. Yeah. And so oh, yeah. that's yeah. kind of like a, that's that 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 would be good with with a Victoria bitter once again. Absolutely. Now, if you're going to sit down with three people, have a, 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 a coffee and just kind of talk story for a few hours, what, who would those three people be? I would love to sit down and just talk with them, uh, get to know them, get to you know hear stories. Yeah, I always think of this question and, and my because I'm, I'm away a lot, my, my initial answer is always like just like have a barbecue with my family. But if it comes to like different people um, around the world that way, I, I'm not sure. There's there's a part of me that's always a little nervous. Like, what would I say to Winston Churchill? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what, what would I ever say to him that's going to, like, get him to stick around for, like, the entire coffee? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm always drawn to sports people. Um, mm-hmm. I think I think someone like, like – I'd, I'd love to sit down and have a yarn with Kelly Slater. He seems like such an interesting guy. Oh, and God, um, absolutely, yeah. Um, At his age to maintain and do what he does. Unbelievable. You know, like I, no one else like it. Um, there was tragically um, one of our great sportsmen passed away a couple of months ago, a, a cricketer named Shane Warne. And I would have loved to have sat down and had a beer with Shane. He just seemed like from everything you ever heard of him, that he was the best guy in the world. And and that was a, a really sad day when he passed away. Um, who else? I don't know. I'd like to maybe sit down with... I don't know. Maybe a maybe a musician of some sort. I don't know. Maybe like a, a maybe like a. Mo, I would have. It would have been really interesting. I, I watched recently the movie Armadeus, and I think it would just be pretty interesting to sit down with Mozart and see what craziness he'd bring to a table. 
The next question, who was your celebrity crush as a kid? That first crush, you're like, oh, my God, this is oh God. This is who I'm following now. I remember watching Wayne's World when I was a kid with my sisters who were a bit older than me. And T career in that, I was like, what's that on screen? Um, and it's just one of my favorite <laughs> movies as well. So maybe that one. Oh, God. I, 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 I interviewed her for something back when I was like 22, 23. Yeah, I'm there with you. That's all I'm saying. Um, <laughs> now, the next question I got for you is um, you're going to be on an island. Uh, no streaming, no nothing. Beautiful, exotic island. Uh, for one year, you can only bring one DVD with you for a movie and a CD, uh, an album. Uh, what would you bring with you? Oh. For a movie... I I love the movie um I love the movie Gladiator. I love that movie. I saw it on my 10th birthday at the cinemas and it was kind of mind blowing. And um that's the first one that comes to my head and for one album if I could take one album maybe maybe something like Maybe something like uh, like one of the Beatles ones. Maybe maybe which is which one has is it Abbey Road that has um, yeah Abbey Road. She came in through the bathroom window and and come together and yeah I love that album. Yeah, and yeah, that it's great something to listen to over and over again. Yeah, you're always going to find something there. Maybe those two. If they're too cliche, I don't care. No, no, it works. It works. Now, now the next question got if you're say from the time you get up to the time you put your head down on the pillow at night, what's the definite, or the component parts for you of a perfect day? Sunshine, warm weather, the ocean, family and friends, a couple of beers and some nice food. Simplicity, I, th- I like it. That's that's actually where I am as well. Eddie, put, mm. put me next to the beach. I think I'm in good shape. Mm. Um, and uh, now, if you were not doing what you're doing now, acting some total different vocation what would you be doing what would be the other thing that would uh light your fire uh uh, apart from you know my desire and like long-held dreams of being a rugby player when i was a kid i think being a professional surfer would have to be right up there with one of the greatest things you could do with your life Oh, ditto. Yeah, I've got a poster over here with uh, the movie Riding Giants, and it was signed by Laird Hamilton. And uh, Oh, amazing. I get to work with Laird on Point Break. Oh, God. I, I'm still yeah. trying to get him on the show here. He's a, he's he's a good guy. He's, a, he's uh, very, like I, Kelly Slater. It's like, how at your age yeah. are you still doing this? Yeah. Uh, now, last question I got for you. Uh, you could jump into DeLorean, head back to when you were 16 years old. You got a piece of advice, a little drop of wisdom for young you that's just going to be right at that, uh, the, what you need to hear at that moment. What would that piece of advice be? Um, keep, I don't know. I, I feel like keep, keep learning, be interested. That would be my advice. Well, my friend, I, I appreciate your time again. Uh, and best of luck to you. Hope you have a nice little uh, little break from uh, work and uh, looking forward to seeing Elvis. Man, enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the uh, new digs, the new home, and uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to c- catch up down the line. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much, Matt. Have a good one. Well, there you go. Uh, Luke Bracey, the man from down under. Uh, what, a, what a great chat. Really enjoy the opportunity to uh, sit down with him and talk about what he's got going on. Don't forget Interceptor, the new movie on Netflix, and of course, Baz Luhrmann's Elvis in theaters right now. All right, so don't forget uh, storyandcraftpod.com, the website. Make sure to pop on over. Shoot me a note. Uh, find, pretty much everything about the show you could ever hope to know is at Story and Craft. Pod.com. Uh, please follow. Get notified every time a new episode rolls out. Of course, we're on your favorite podcast app, and that's what you're listening on right now, I'm assuming. All right, so go have a great rest of your day. Uh, looking forward to connecting with you for the next episode of Story and Craft. That's it for this episode of Story and Craft. Join Mark next week for more conversation right here on Story and Craft. Story and Craft is a presentation of Mark Preston Productions, LLC. Executive producer is Mark Preston. Associate producer is Zachary Holden. 
please rate and review Story and Craft on Apple Podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. You can subscribe to show updates and stay in the know. Just head to storyandcraftpod.com and sign up for the newsletter. I'm Emma Dillon. See you next time. And remember, keep telling your story. Come on.